And she, here she is back to the drawing board. Lisa Lampanelli, everybody. Lisa Lampanelli. Which one do you use it in? Thank you, Ron. Hi, everybody. Hi. Yay. Oh, my God. <laughs> How much fun is this? This is amazing. I am so happy to be here. This is, like, so legendary. I saw Don Rickles get interviewed here, Alan Zweibel. I mean, there was pictures of Bill Gates backstage. I was sure. like, oh, my God, I do not belong here. <laughs> do you really still feel that way? That Yeah, I always feel like I'm less than those people, but then I'm like, ah, eh, screw it. I do what I do. <laughs> I do my best, and whatever's supposed to happen will happen. The new special is coming out now. Yes. And this is the first time that you really came out as the new Lisa with your, with your new body and everything. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting because I think I had to lose the weight in order to kind of get to the real stuff. Like this is the first special where I really talk about my life. People ask me a lot in interviews about the divorce, about you know weight loss surgery, about my struggle with body image and weight. And I just said, you know what, in this special I'm gonna tell the truth and come out with all the answers that people wanna know. But isn't that, it's so difficult I think when a stand up performs, the physicality is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. To change that physicality, whether it's to gain weight or to lose weight, it's a very difficult thing to pull off. Well, I couldn't even consider comedy when I decided to get the weight loss surgery because it takes up so much of my mind in my life. Like, ever since I got, started gaining weight at age 18, honestly, I'm surprised that I even have a career because as anyone with a weight struggle or any other struggle knows, it takes up 100% of your thoughts at all times. What you're eating, what you're not eating, if you're working out, if you're working out too much or too little. So I'm shocked that I even have a career because it's so difficult to manage all that at once. So I had to get the weight out of the way, then start working on the internal stuff that caused the weight in the first place. But you always seem to be so comfortable on stage before. On stage, I was always comfortable. It's the one place I really felt I could be myself. Now you get me one-on-one -on -one with a person and I'm horrible. I'm getting better at it. But, you know, having a real connection one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's with a, you know, a husband or a boyfriend or even friendship, that was harder than being on stage in front of, I mean, I've been on stage in front of 20,000 people at some points, and that's easy. Mm -hmm. The real intimacy one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one is really, really hard. But to go, and, and, and you were very sensitive about the weight. Ever oh, yeah. since you were a kid. Yeah. And then to take that and go into a roast with, mm those pirates yeah. and you know yeah, yeah. just really really killers How? it's really interesting the roasts never hurt my feelings because i always knew i went hard i mean i said things that the roast no one should be allowed to say in their mm. life i mean I, I killed donald trump i mean telling donald <laughs> trump saying he puts up more worthless hotels than an autistic child playing monopoly right. it's not really nice you know <laughs> It really isn't. It's not like, oh, she's so sweet, you know? Yeah. So the roasts I always knew were set up for jokes. And I remember some of my favorite jokes about myself were from the roasts, and I put them in my book, you know? Um, I remember Artie Lang, <laughs> when he was at his fattest and grayest and he, from heroin, <laughs> and he looked like he was about to die of overweight, every disease <laughs> in the world, he said, and this is the best joke about me ever, Oh my God, if I had a nickel for every time somebody said, hey, aren't you Lisa Lampanelli? <laughs> <laughs> it's a yeah. great joke! Right. So if something's inarguably funny, how can't you laugh at that? It was just off stage. And you know, it started to get to me with this Twitter. Because Twitter <laughs> is the new heckler, but it's even more cowardly than a heckler. Because a heckler, at least, you know, if somebody yelled out now, I could call them a cunt or something. <laughs> and I could just really go at it, and that's brave that they want to get into a scuffle. But if you're being heckled online, it's by some troll in his basement, and he probably doesn't even pay rent to his mother, who he still lives with, <laughs> but yet it still hurt my feelings a right. lot. So for a while, I had to stop reading Twitter altogether till I could grow sort of a thicker skin and take it. But you know, that's the interesting thing about Twitter is that people can reach you. I mean, when mm -hmm. you were younger, there was no way for you to, 
talk to Joan Rivers, you wouldn't be able right. to get in touch with her. I know, I kind of resent that you lowlifes are allowed to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm very famous. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, I used to engage in Twitter a lot during The Celebrity Apprentice. I was like, first of all, if you saw me on The Apprentice, I was a mental patient. <laughs> I was angry, I was hormonal, I was going through menopause. I mean, that's what they get for putting a hormonal bitch on stage <laughs> on The Apprentice. Yeah. So it was really a tough show, but then I get so much hate through the Twitter. I said, oh, Vey, when I get this weight loss surgery, I said, I gotta stop reading Twitter or I'm not gonna heal physically. I think it would have really held me back. So I just recently started reading it again now that I have more confidence and I could kind of take it as a joke instead of take it personally. But for a long time, it, it was tough for you to hear. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, even now, it's so funny that the, there's still insults that people throw to me like, oh, you're too skinny now. Oh, that's always, by the way, from some fat bitch who wants me to stay fat like them. Fuck them. Um, yeah. Oh, and I always love the you're not funny now that you're thinner. And I always throw that at Jonah Hill too. And I'm like, yeah, but he got nominated for two Oscars. Right. That's pretty damn good. Yeah. So I just say, you know what? They're gonna have their opinions. I'm only gonna respond if it's funny. You know, I think somebody tweeted something about how I look, uh, like Joan Rivers, but worse now that she's dead or something like that. And I thought it was funny, so I retweeted it. So, but I think unless I had the way, unless I had the way, you sent that, didn't you? Yeah, I don't think it was. Uh, <laughs> I think until I got the weight off, I couldn't feel like I could have a sense of humor about myself, you know? But I live in constant dread about gaining the weight back. That's the whole thing. Once you've done this and once Yahoo Beauty does an article on you saying, oh, she lost 107 pounds, I feel like, oh my God, I have to work on this issue every day. Dude, six times a day I'm asking myself, am I really hungry or am I emotionally eating? Because that's the big battle now. Well, see, that's what I was uh, talking about when I said you're in such a transition. And I think you see that in the new special. There's one part of the special that you're purely the queen of mean. Yeah. You know, you're just going out there doing your thing that you do so well. And then there's another part of it where we see you open up mm -hmm. about who you really are. Right. And it's pretty shocking. Well, it's the thing is, I was writing a one person show with Alan Zweibel, who's very famous for co writing Billy Crystal's 700 Sundays. And Alan was really into the idea of really digging deep, like what's really there. So it kind of forced me to do that. And I ended up putting some of it in my stand up because I got a divorce last year and I fully take responsibility for at least 50% of that divorce. <laughs> I mean, you know, come on, yeah, that's, but, fully 50%. This you know? is huge for her. Yeah, yeah, I actually take some blame. <laughs> so I said, what are my real faults that people have no idea contributed yeah. to it? Because, you know, I have anger issues, I'm always crying, no. but, I won't, <laughs> but I won't cry in front of anyone because it looks too vulnerable. I uh, hate the way I look. I, I, I can't, I'm terrible at sex. Oy vey, nobody <laughs> wants to know about that. So I said, let me put it out there because I honestly feel it's weird. If you keep it a secret, mm. you're not helping anybody else with their issues. If somebody comes away from even a comedy special like this and says, wow, I really hate the way I look too. If she can work on it, so can I. Or, hey, I have anger issues. Maybe I should see a shrink too. I think it's better to put it out there. We're only as sick as our secrets, like they say. Well, but for you, mm -hmm. uh, being an in insult comic is mm -hmm. the way that you came on. To now get vulnerable yeah. on yeah. stage. I kind of love it though. Like it's super tense and it's super fun. Like the other night, um, this isn't in the special because it just happened for the first time Saturday. I talked about how Caitlyn Jenner, I am so proud of Caitlyn Jenner because becoming the person that he wanted to be all along and not being in shame. So I said, we all have stuff we hold in for shame and it hurts us more by holding it in. And to tell people your shame is very freeing. And so I told a few things about myself and then I said, who in the audience has something they're ashamed of? And some woman just looks around, she goes, I'm a stripper. <laughs> I go, I am so proud of you. <laughs> not just for saying that, but for not losing balance without the pole. <laughs> and then some gay guy yelled out. He goes, I'll tell you something. I'm not ashamed to say if I went straight, I would F you. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm not ashamed to say I'd probably let you. Because <laughs> so, I think we're all, 
held down by something we don't want to tell anyone. That's why I'm an open book. That's why when we do this, there's no question you have to run by me in advance. Sure. My publicist has the easiest job in the world. I told that bitch I will answer any question in the world. <laughs> why not? Just be open. But at the same time, you still have that ability if someone crosses the line. Oh my God. You're still the queen of mean. Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, hecklers, I don't even know why they would even bother at this point. Yeah. It's, you guys, when you go home, on YouTube, there is a seven minute video of me ruining this woman in Vancouver. And you think those freaking Canadians are polite. They're a bunch of jerks like you guys too. So check it out, this bitch, she yelled the one thing you should never say to me, because this is a real hot button for me. I kicked some guy out of the room, out of the uh, theater. The audience was very happy because he was disrupting it and they pay good money and I don't think that they should be spoiled from seeing a good time by this guy. So she, this woman, pipes up and she says, listen, <laughs> we pay you, so you have to do everything we want. I'm like, bitch. <laughs> I said, start taping. I told everybody tape it. It's on YouTube. I went so hard after her because I am not your slave. You know what I mean? It's like I'm there to entertain you. Comedy is the only art form that you can yell stuff at people. Like, you can't go to see Evita on Broadway. How about that for a 200-year-old reference? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, you can't go to see, like, Book of Mormon and yell, you're a C-word. You can't do right. that. And it's like why they're allowed to with comedy, I will never know. Because it's just as much an art form as anything else. Sure. Well, it's the only art form that you're kind of performing and writing at the same time. Yeah, that's you, fine. Yeah, you'll never, well, I don't think, other than probably Dylan, someone just goes off and mm -hmm. starts to say words that they never did before. Right. But you, when you walk out on the stage, you kind of know what you're going to do. But loosely. really, yeah. Yeah, real but really, loosely. you're out there for an hour, hour 10, hour 15, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you don't know what that experience is gonna be. I, I know, mean, but I, that's what makes it fun for me. Like, I'm not the type of comic who could do the same set every night. I respect the guys who can, I can't. I'd be bored to death, I'd just quit. It's not even worth it. So I go, oh, you know, I never know what my first line's gonna be. I never know the first thing I'm gonna say. And also, I never know the audience makeup. Is it gonna be all white? Is it gonna be black and white? Is it gonna be black and white couples? Is it gonna be Asians? Or will they all be at the slot machine at the casino? I don't know. <laughs> so, it's just like fun for me. Oh my God, my show in Denver Saturday, it was during Gay Pride. Hello, that was the <laughs> best show ever. A bunch of stoned homos, that is the best. Even the lesbians got into it. And they really? Can yeah. Be, yes, they can usually be very mean. Well, <laughs> I'm going to let her say these things. <laughs> I don't even want to agree. <laughs> Just, uh, but you have had that gay audience for a long time. Yeah. What? How did that hook up? How did you that what? happen? I don't know what happened. Here's what I always thought. I had a book signing at this gay bookstore in Atlanta. And they, I said to those gays, I said, you gays need to tell me why you like me. Is it because you feel like you're kind of not really included? And in you feel out of place and you can sense I feel out of place? And one of them said, that might be part of it, but I think it's just because we like a mean bitch. <laughs> I like to think it was something bigger than that and it was yeah. an internal message, but clearly the homos are on my side. Right. And honestly, I joke about the lesbians, but they have gotten on my case in a good way lately because it used to be years ago, I could not win them over, no matter what I did. I think now that I cut the hair, they're feeling like <laughs> yeah. it's working better, thank God. <laughs> but, you know, I, it's very funny because people talk about politically correct comedy mm -hmm. now, and Jerry Seinfeld, of all people, just came right, out and said... Right, of all people, yeah. I know. Uh, you know. But then I watched your special, and there's really no holes barred. No, I mean, you're saying things be. that no one is saying right now. Yeah, which is great, but it's funny how it took Seinfeld to bring it to light that political correctness is too much. I've been complaining about it for years. So is Sarah Silverman, Jim Norton, David Tell. Anybody edgy has been complaining about political correctness. But it takes a guy like Seinfeld 
that even he feels it. And this is a guy who really does clean, kind of safe humor that's sure. hilarious. I mean, what did he do a bit about a cotton ball being black instead of white? <laughs> you know, really tough stuff, Jerry. So, you know. <laughs> you know, so the whole thing is, it's like, thank God he came out and said it, or yeah. else real people wouldn't start to go, you know, let's, this is getting a little ridiculous. And yet, you've always, I I've never seen you apologize no. for anything in your act. Because I'd be apologizing every weekend. <laughs> I'd be sending notes and cards and flowers and F them. I want to keep my money. The thing is, I don't apologize because I mean everything with love. If I sit here and I call you a fat bastard radio host who's a loser with a dream, you're going to know. <laughs> no, you're going to know that I don't mean it because we're friends. No, it's true. No, you know how much I love Ron. If Ron wasn't married, I would do him right now, so shut up. No, but everybody seems to know that I mean out of the goodness sure. of my heart what I say, so I don't let it bother me. If somebody says you owe so-and-so an apology, I go, yeah, I don't think so. I remember the first night The Apprentice was coming on. Oh my God, I was having all my gay friends over to watch the first episode of The Apprentice. You were there, right, Taylor? That's my fag, Taylor. <laughs> now, Taylor taught me, by the way, Taylor taught me the greatest fisting joke of all time. We'll oh, tell geez. it later. But no, I was having all my gay friends over to watch Celebrity Apprentice. Well, I tweeted out there, hey, if all the glory holes in Manhattan are open tonight, it's because I'm having all the gays over to my house to watch The Apprentice. <laughs> I get like 150 gay guys laughing it up. One politically correct little biatch who probably had a gay brother or something is like, how dare you? What kind of comedian are you? And I'm like, you're blocked. I can't even. Right. If you follow me, you have to know that this is what I do. Sure. If you don't, that's OK. Watch somebody else. I got no problem with that. But do you really think that if people thought that you meant the thing, yes. they'd be gone? I've seen comics where you could tell they hate a certain group. And you could just tell from that lack of warmth and that vibe. And you go, ooh, they kind of mean that. And it's usually when they single out one group. It's usually mm -hmm. if it's just Asians, because Asians are always the ones who seem to get crapped on by comics. It seems to be OK to do that. I don't know. Yeah. Or Jews. It's really weird. It's, it's wrong. I say if you can't make fun of everybody, you can't make fun of anybody. The only people I characteristically leave out are the French, because nobody likes them. But it's true. <laughs> that goes without saying. Yeah, it's of course. <laughs> yeah. Hey, by the way, you don't work out in any of the New York clubs, right? You No, I don't do comedy anywhere but the theaters on the weekends because I feel like if a bit is new, which a lot of them start out on the stage for me, I just do them during my shows on the weekend. I'll make it funny. I'll make it funny enough that the audience likes it. You put some good stuff before it, some good stuff after it, and you make sure that you're, I mean, at this point, 25 years, I know how to save a bit. Right. So, yeah, I just, I, I can't be bothered running around. I, I like to have a life. I'm 53 years old. I want to, like, see friends and family and, you know, not be a slave to comedy. But you have that confidence to go out and work new material. Oh, yeah. In front of a big theater. Yeah. Like I said, that shame thing the other night was hysterical. Oh, yeah. And it wasn't because I'm some kind of genius, but it's just because, oh, it's fun and in the moment. People love in the moment. Yeah. Uh, you know, when we talk about, uh, and you brought this up, we're you know, as sick as our secrets. Mm -hmm. You bring up a well-known comedian in your special, mm -hmm. uh, beloved for decades, Bill Cosby. Mm -hmm. You don't kind of give both sides no. of what no. could have happened. No, because yeah. he didn't even try to rape me, and I resent <laughs> it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but was that, um, was this stunning to you when this stuff started? No, it was not shocking <laughs> to me, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> My father, God rest his soul, always had these people's number. He goes, what, remember, I love Rosie O'Donnell, but I remember my father watching her years ago when she had the talk zone say, she's hiding something. <laughs> and she was, which uh, sadly she shouldn't have because I loved the gay people. Well. <laughs> this Bill Cosby, I always had his little number. Because remember when he bought the Little Rascals so nobody could watch him again because they said he said they were racist? If the Little Rascals were racist, by the way, they wouldn't have had Buckwheat and Farina as their friends. That's comedy, inclusion of everybody. So Bill Cosby can suck it. He's a raper, I guarantee it. I'm telling you. Yep. <laughs> 
So you just started to hear the accusations Oh, yeah, and I the said it's only a matter of time. Anybody who presents themselves as father of the year isn't. We've always seen the guy on the plane with the wife and the babies and the father's acting like he takes care of them all week. <laughs> oh, oh, it's the wife who's doing every goddamn thing, you stupid jerk. Now sit down and read the paper like you do at home. So I always know these father of the years. When he was like, fatherhood, fatherhood, I said, take your sweater and strangle yourself. I don't trust you. <laughs> it's true, I don't run. Yeah. So where do you think it'll go with him? You think he'll end up in prison? Or? I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. Because what goes around comes around. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I think and the reason, I, and I, I thought of this immediately, yeah. for years, people thought of him as the perfect role sure. model. And people thought of you as... The raper. Yes. Oh, wait, <laughs> what? <laughs> Only once in college. Um, no. I think people who are edgier on stage have less to hide. Uh, you are never going to hear a rape accusation against Louis C.K. You're never going to hear. I No, seriously. I think we're edgy, and we just put it out there, and we tell the truth. And I think people who set themselves up as some kind of spiritual guru or somebody who's the, the, the person above all, those are the people who have to take the tumble. So see ya. <laughs> but decades, decades that he yeah. was... Yeah, I didn't buy it for a second, Ron. Never bought it. Never bought it. You know, uh, I think, uh, you know, when I met Joan Rivers, mm -hmm. an incredibly sweet, kind yeah. person. Yeah. Uh, and there were people that thought just the opposite. Sure. And I remember the first time I met you, I said, I don't know how this is going to go. Right, you know? right. And I was amazed within seconds to see that you're always right in the moment and I see you caring about other people. Well, you'd leave it on the stage. Like, how crappy would it be for a comic's life if you were how you were on stage when you were off stage? Like, Robin Williams wasn't nutty and crazy like that. He, I heard stories where he would actually, if he'd meet somebody in the street, they'd want him to be all performy and he'd say, no, no, let's talk about you. What do you do for a living? So he really w wanted to hear about them. That's what I'd rather hear about. Mm. You know, and yeah, we'll be funny if we have to, like for a charity or something. Like I do these dinners at the Friars Club where I'm like, they, you know, auction off for a charity and I'll have to have dinner with four losers who I can't stand. So uh, <laughs> I always bring back up to help me have a conversation because right. you never know what you're going to get with these idiots. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So those people you have to be a little funny with, but eventually it settles down to just conversation. And that's what I like, because I think it's all about connecting. That's why I always did the crowd work and the insults, because it's about connecting with people instead of just reciting, because I'm just not into that. So every night you're looking for that one moment where you connect with the audience. Like right? more than one, Ron, I'm a professional. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying as soon as that hits, you know oh, yeah, that you're it. home. Yeah. Well, you know, you brought up the Friars Club, and they were... Uh, and there haven't been a lot of women friars that, you know, normally they'll invite people in after they're famous. Mm -hmm. But before you were famous, you were a friar. Boy, and was they I were lucky. so oh. helpful to you. I'm the luckiest person alive because if there was no friars, I'm not kidding, I would have never gotten on TV because they used to produce the roast in conjunction with Comedy Central. Mm -hmm. And they were roasting this Chevy Chase. Now, this humorless bastard was going to end up making our lives miserable that night. But the Friars had said, you got to put this girl on, even though you never heard of her. Comedy Central was like, eh. They were like, you got to do this for us. So I said, that's my shot. So thank God I was able to look past his sunglasses and his staring aimlessly into the audience. And I was like, I have to kill her, else I'll have no career. But if it wasn't for the Friars, forget about it. You know, that's, uh, that piece is up on YouTube. And you can see you walk out as one person and walk, you know, backstage as another because everything changed for you. Yeah, oh my God, moments. what a blessing. And I don't even know how I got into the Friars Club. I think it happened where someone invited me to a show there to watch and I'm just like staring at the walls because if you've ever been there, it's so legendary and you're like so fascinated by the pictures. And eventually somebody took pity on me and they're like, you know, you might as well join. So I was like, well, that's cool. And it just took off. I just think it's there's a very rare, like years ago, I remember I talked to David Brenner and he talked about when he did a Tonight Show, mm. things changed for him after. Right. That doesn't happen Not anymore. anymore. Yeah. But it happened for you, I think. I think the roast, and also my first Tonight Show made my bones definitely because it was Simon Cowell was the right. uh, co-guest. And if it's on, it's on YouTube, it's the best because that guy, 
He was so much fun. He said, please make fun of me when you come out. So mm. we went back and forth and it was like, it was truly like, that was a game changer. Right. There's very few resume changers in my career. And it was definitely that one, definitely my first appearance on Howard Stern, because I mean, yeah. talk about a guy who can make your career now. Howard Stern's now the Johnny Carson of our day. You do well on his show, you're gonna sell tickets the next day. So those are the things that really added to. Now, is that him or does he also pay attention that you connect it with his audience? It's, yeah. it's almost like you, your act was built to do. Yeah, Howard's yeah, because for a while, because he's so edgy, then also he used to do roast too. I don't mm -hmm. even remember, he did a bunch of roasts. He did the craziest roast ever. There was this guy named Daniel Carver, and he's the head of the Ku Klux Klan, <laughs> and he wanted a bunch of minorities and women to roast Daniel Carver, <laughs> but we, like idiots, say yes. The problem is, you can't roast somebody you hate, because everybody <laughs> just agrees with the jokes, and they're not funny, you're just saying what a racist douchebag this guy is. <laughs> it was such a hard roast, but somehow it came out all right, we pulled it off. But yeah, Howard just has great ideas, like you do. Like your show is nothing like other people's shows. If you guys don't listen to him, you're out of your mind. Mm -hmm. This guy, I, if Howard left Sirius tomorrow, which I pray he doesn't, I would keep Sirius just for you because he delves in deep. He doesn't go surfacy. you don't hand him questions before, he just goes in deep and raw, and that's what we need more of, because then people hear how people really conduct themselves. Well, see, that is, I think, the way you and I connected, because you were ready to tell this story, and I think, especially a couple of years ago, no one knew that you were dealing with pain and fear. I mean, there was right. nothing right. about you. No, because I remember that off. one time I was on Howard right after The Apprentice, and he said, uh, did you, were you afraid of Victoria Gotti on The Apprentice? Did you think, you know, effing with her would put your life in danger? And I made some joke about it. He goes, oh, come on, tell the truth. And I was like, wow, I really have to just start telling the truth. Enough of the jokey. Yeah, it's great to be funny and you should throw a punchline in here or there, but you kind of should tell the truth. But up to that point, it felt like you were always hiding. Well, yeah, because I think the weight, too, is a way of hiding from mm -hmm. the world. The weight is a way of being invisible. Um, now, every woman knows there comes the age, your weight, or some other handicap that makes you invisible to everybody. You know, that's the time when the cat calls stop, you know? Like, you're in your 20s, everybody complains about going past a construction site and some guy yelling, nice jugs, but wait till you're over 30, bitches. You're gonna miss it. <laughs> it's true, you know? So that's the thing. You do feel like weight is a way of holding you from being even seen in life. And when, you, when I got rid of that, I go now, like I said, I could work on the internal stuff, the anger, you know, the emotional back and forths and all the stuff that weren't bringing people closer to me, they were pushing them far, farther away. And you could feel that happen. You could feel you yeah. pushing people away. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a, anger is the best way of pushing people away, you know? And you know when it really dawned on me that my anger was, I mean, my anger was always crazy, but like my poor ex-husband, Jimmy Big Walls, who happens to be here tonight because we're still good friends, um, with his beautiful girlfriend, Jenna, who I love. We, I called him once on Christmas Eve because I was just at a hairdresser's in Fairfield, <laughs> Connecticut, and the guy was late for my appointment. Well, God forbid you keep me waiting back then. So I called Jimmy and I was going, yeah, and I told this MF or this and that, and I'm screaming, and I'm thinking the story's really funny, and Jimmy's kind of going along with the funniness. And then I just got off the phone. I go, that did not feel good. I got to stop with that stuff. This is not serving me. I had to tip the guy extra. So I go, this is, you know, I was handing out a lot of money. Now when I go to hotels, I honestly check in and I will go, hi, how are you? Uh, did I yell at you last time? Because if I did, I'm really sorry. Yeah. Because you, I mean, Jimmy knows I used to be mentally ill. I would be at like a Ritz Carlton and they'd send up the wrong food and I would call up and this would be me. I would be so gangster idiotic. I would be like, hi, yeah, where am I calling? And they'd be like, Ritz Carlton. And I'm like, oh, because I thought it was a Super 8 because the fucking order's wrong. Really? Really? Maybe get it together, a-holes. And I'm like, oh my my God, like what is wrong with me? I'm doing comedy for a living. I got a great family, I got great friends. What is the anger? Let's work on that, get rid of it. And believe it or not, people get closer to you, they like you. Now did you? <laughs> it's nice. But did you figure out where the anger came from, the reason? For it or? I don't know, I just think it's from stuffing feelings for my whole yeah. life. And by the way, 
so much was coming out, but sideways, they call it. Anger is, comes out sideways. It's really sadness or mm. depression or frustration. It's, it, anger is just sort of a cover-up emotion. So I think where is if I didn't cry, I, di I remember my grandmother died when I was, I think in college. I didn't cry about it until 20 years later when I was in a bed, bath, and beyond, and I saw, <laughs> I know, right? And the girl from Gilmore Girls was in there, <laughs> and I looked at like this thing, this, you know those canister sets that they sell for sugar and all that? And I remember my grandmother had got that for me for my first wedding, and I, would, I just started crying, and Alexis Bledel probably looked at me like I was a freaking mental patient. <laughs> but I, I used to not mourn things in their correct time. I used to be sad about breakups, but I'd act angry instead. So I think now it's like cry when I'm upset instead of yell about it, and it just works out better. Well, what about joy? Is joy? So much easier. Is it? Well, yeah, I honestly feel my purpose. You know, I, I have a lot of beginning comics that I coach or, you know, friends helping them with the business and stuff, and they can't decide what their purpose is. You know, and I, think, I don't think it's an action. I don't think it's like a way of life. I think it's a feeling. Like I said, my purpose in life is to feel peace. I just want to feel peace. So all my choices get made out of, will that bring me peace eventually or even today? So yeah, I pick things based on that and joy's a part of it. If it brings you joy, I mean, oh my God, I have this awesome dog and like just playing with the dog, I feel joy and also peace when he just sits there. So those are the things I invite in and the things I say no to just don't add to my life anymore. Doesn't it seem though that joy or even peace don't have the shelf life of anger and fear? No, I don't think that's true. You think? I think anger and fear are quickly gone when you concentrate on the joy and the peace. For instance, I worked, um, my opening act recently quit comedy, so I had to hire a bunch of other guys. So I worked with a guy Saturday night, and he had opened for me in Washington, D.C., just a normal white guy, straight, has material about his kids and his wife, you know, good enough, but nothing dynamic. I asked him to do Denver last week because nobody else could make it. This kid was so grateful to be there that I texted my best friend and I said, dude, I go, his gratitude at this gig makes me grateful that I'm here. Right. So if you start taking all that stuff in, you start to feel that underlying joy and peace. And sometimes, yeah, I have to force it. Like when I have no sleep and I really want to yell at somebody, I go, let me not. I'll owe another apology. I won't be able to look myself in the mirror. And at the end of the day, all we want to do is look at ourselves in the mirror and not be mad at ourselves. Mm. I think that this, I've never seen a comic talk this way before. I think that most comedians would be fearful to take down the character and sit around and talk about stuff like that. Well, I don't have a choice because I'm so bored of pretending to just be, I am on stage all the time. It's just mm -hmm. boring to me. And I just like talking about other subjects that I work on. You know, like I love working on connecting with people and spirituality. I like to do this thing called day making. It's super queer, but <laughs> I read this book and it's out of print called My Life is a Daymaker that some hairdresser wrote. And he said, every day, just try to make somebody's day in a little way. So I try to like, you know, pay for somebody's coffee behind me or whatever. And I always say, I'm not gonna brag about these things so I think that's why God doesn't give me a good uh, relationship because he's like maybe if you shut the F up about everything you do for people <laughs> I'll give you a good husband yeah so uh, but yesterday do you know how good I felt this is gonna come off as bragging but I promise it's not I just have to tell you it was so cute it's five in the morning I'm at the airport in Denver and I go to caribou coffee because they're so backwards they don't have Starbucks and <laughs> there was this Latino kid who was working there, and I have never seen a better attitude in my life. This guy was like, what can I get you, this and that. And he was just so bright-eyed and lit up, and hopefully it wasn't the cocaine, but he was so happy. <laughs> and I wrestle with myself. I'm sitting there, and I go, I have $100. I want to give it to that kid and say, you are going to run a business with that attitude someday. Go buy some books. But then I'm sitting there, I go, I second guess myself. I go, maybe he'll think like, oh, she thinks I'm poor because I'm Latino. And I was like, wait a minute. That's not my intention. My intention was to help him have some self-confidence. And I gave it to him and he was so cute. He was like, are you sure? Are you sure? I go, shut the hell up or I'll take it back, you <laughs> douche. And isn't that fun to do? Sure. Like, how much fun is that? Yeah. But you know, uh, and that's the thing, I think it really comes down to two things always. 
and service and gratitude. Service is huge. Yeah. Service is like the biggest thing in my life because I think what happens is as comics, we tend to be super self-centered. It's sure. always about how can I get on the next TV show? How can I get more money? How can I get more fame so I can feel some self-worth? So it all comes down, my best friend calls it the six degrees of worthiness. Everything we try to go after other than if it's service or acceptance is definitely driven out of, I don't feel worthy this way. Mm. I said to somebody, I said to you on the radio the other day, I can't wait till I feel so worthy as a human being that I could just quit comedy and not need any audience and just be like happy just being me and going all the happiness is coming from in here because nothing fills the hole and no matter how much money you have no matter what fame get a freaking boat don't i mean i love donald trump but i doubt that all that stuff he has fills the hole if nine billion can't fill the hole and that, that hot wife of his then nothing can fill the hole yeah so i think just going with getting it from in here is what i strive for well, I've heard that uh, described as a God-shaped hole. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Something that you're looking for. And your spirituality, is it specific or is it... Oh, no. Uh, we were raised Catholic, and I just it never resonated with me. In fact, me and my brother, Leonard, would always skip church. Like, what, as soon as we learned how to drive, we would get, my mom would go, you going to church? I'm like, yeah, yeah. So we'd get in the car, and like, she'd look at me, and I'd look at him, and we'd go, yeah, Pac-Man, and we'd drive to the mall. So it was innocent, but we'd yeah. pick up the church bulletin on the way home, so my mother would think we went. Yeah. I don't think we had her fooled, by the way. She was pretty smart. So um, I never liked, you know, it never resonated with me, mm -hmm. but I just think recently the service idea resonated with me enough to start looking into Buddhism, start looking into just more ways of seeing the world as connected to each other. Because what I do and say to you definitely affects her and her and her, and we just are all connected. I don't think we're all separate. Well, that's kind of interesting because the, the audience with a comedian, I think more than anyone, but a comedian always talks about the audience. The audience was good or the mm -hmm. audience was bad. They never see them as a group of individuals right. who came here separately. Right. And that's, that could either be a great thing or in the case of a lot of comedians, I think it keeps them blocked off. That's true. People. I always light the first six rows of the audience so I could see them individually. Is that right? It used to be to make fun of people and to be able to you know, pick out who's different racial and sexual orientation and stuff. But now it's more I like the connection and being like, yeah, like I get you and you get me. And I, I honestly, I had a comedy teacher years ago called Tim Davis at Stand Up New York who said, you're not there for you, you're there for them. And oh my God, is he right? And you could tell when a comic's there for themselves, when they're there to just get therapy from the audience, which is not our job. They're the ones who paid the money. Right. We're supposed to be giving to them. I think that's missing with a lot of comics because I mean, honestly, we're telling our dumb stories and jokes. And Jim Carrey said it so well in his commencement speech from that university. He said, uh, comedians are freers of other people's concerns. So for an hour and a half, they could sit there and not worry about the job they lost or the parent they lost or the kid who's sick. So we have to be there for them or it doesn't resonate with me at all. Well, it's always amazing to me too, how many comedians once they leave the stage and they get this mm -hmm. love and acceptance and admiration and they leave the stage and you could just watch it drop down. And I, yeah, you know, yeah. It's, uh, me, even some of the people you brought up tonight, Jim Carrey mm -hmm. has wrestled with it. Robin Williams, who mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if anyone right, right. should have been able to, if, if getting that love and acceptance from an audience would work to make you happy, he would have been the happiest of person course. I, I in the world. Of course, I don't think, I think if you take it in as just love and joy and connection and then kind of forget it when you leave in a good way mm -hmm. and go, oh, that was just my job and I'm so happy it went well and then go home and have a real life. I mean, I look forward to coming home just as much as I do going out on stage. Like I'd rather, we have, uh, my sister and brother and I try to have a weekly or bi-weekly uh, dinner and game night with my mom, right? Because we lost our father. So my mother just loves dinner and games. She loves to play apples to apples. She's a maniac with this. <laughs> we tried to make her play Cards Against Humanity once, but it didn't turn out good. So that, I get just as much self-esteem from that night as I do from on stage. And I think that's the way life's supposed to be. It's just a job. And that wasn't like that for you before though, right? It was just after my dad died that I was like, oh, service is what really counts because we were able to take care of my dad at home for six months. 
and we were able to all band together. And I go, man, I miss that. Why don't I do that for other people now, too? Well, some of these folks have uh, filled out questions. Yeah. Yes. So, um, <laughs> and I guess they didn't trust them to say it. <laughs> so I'm going to read some of these to you. All right. Um, what triggered your love of rescue animals? Oh, my God. I love my dog so much. I'm so gay for my dog. Okay, <laughs> here's what happened. I used to live on the Upper West Side, and every Sunday they had their rescue, right? And they always had big dogs and cats. And in New York City, you can't really have a big dog in your apartment, and I hate cats. So um, I, uh, one day I was walking to lunch to meet a friend of mine, and there was this little dog, and I knew he was gonna be adopted quick because he's so small and perfect for an apartment, but I go, I'm late for lunch, and at that time I was really heavy, so I'm like, food has the priority. And I was like, <laughs> if the universe intends me to have this dog, he'll still be here in two hours after I'm done eating. Well, he was still there, and I tell you what, he is the best dog ever. I named him Parker, <laughs> after Sarah Jessica Parker. Uh. Yay! <laughs> and oh my God, if you ever get a dog, listen to me. Go online and order a service vest. You can bring your stupid dog in anywhere. My dog is about as useful as a Kardashian in a library. It don't matter. <laughs> Parker goes everywhere. Oh yeah, and I just, and it all escalated to where the North Shore Animal League asked me to be the uh, host of their big, big gala this year in November. Uh, Beth Stern is in charge of that, so I was very excited. But I really love the idea of adoption. I might even, after I hit 60 or something, adopt a kid. You never know. Is that right? Yeah, I may be like Joan Crawford. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has to clean the toilet. <laughs> But, you know, it's funny, uh, you know, we've been talking about some of these ideas that are slowly, will they change the world or not, but the rescue animal thing has now just resonated with, across the board. Yes. Down to with the fact of people that you would have never expected right. to talk about it before. Yeah, I mean, I can't believe I even have an animal, because what happened was we never had pets growing up. So I think, Alan Bell, when we were digging for the One Person Show, really made me wrestle with why I never had kids. And I had to think about it and think about it and journal and write. And it really is because I really felt I couldn't handle it if something happened to them. Even now, like, I am in a panic always over my nieces and nephews because I'm always like, oh, my God, I hope they're okay. I hope they have enough money. I hope, you know, honestly, when I, this is not a joke. When the girls go away to college, I'm always scared that they'll, you know, meet the wrong guys and there's date rape and there's hazing and fraternities. And I go insane. I can't be that kind of mother. So. With a dog, I go, oh my God, how will I handle it if this dog dies? And I'm like, you know what, you gotta take a risk. I heard the most beautiful story once. There was an elderly woman on a bus, and this is in the 70s, and there was a black man on the uh, bus with a big afro. And she went over, she was like 90 years old, and she touched him on the head, and he looked over and she said, I would have never known if I hadn't touched it how soft it was. And I go, oh my God, if I never had adopted this dog, I wouldn't have known how great it was. Mm. And now I'm at the age where I don't regret not having kids because I probably wouldn't have had the career I did, but I really regret I won't have grandkids because that looks like the most fun thing in the world. Because I mean, you could spoil the hell out of them to get back at their rotten parents. Sure. So my, it's funny, I did deal with this with a spirituality leader and she said, well, you have nieces and nephews. They're special, too. So I figure I'm going to suck up enough to them so that when they have kids, those could be my honorary grandkids <laughs> so I could still get the fix. So I, right. think, I feel like that would be missing if I didn't. Well, who wouldn't want a like a great aunt in show business? Wouldn't that be it the greatest cool. thing? It is kind of cool. It is kind of cool. I yeah. get them. Well, I hope I get them experiences they wouldn't have had. I go, hope I get them good tickets for things. You know, and I just always go, oh, I hope they know how special they are. You yeah. know, I just love that age group. You know, anybody. Well, they're really awful when they're below three. Mm. So, um, <laughs> you know, if I adopted, it would have to be like either somebody between three and 13 or like a really hot 25 year old. Yeah, say. <laughs> well, let's be real. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's another one. And uh, this says, I'd like to see the person who wrote this too. Uh -oh. Is Donald Trump as big a douchebag 
as he seems to be. You know what? I don't think so. I may be highly unpopular, but he's always so nice to me. Because I think on the show, when I was on The Apprentice, I was close enough to his age, and he saw how a hard worker I was, so he treated me very well. He treated me like an equal. But you know what I said about Donald Trump? This presidential thing is a little crazy mm -hmm. because for years he tortured poor President Barack Obama about presenting a birth certificate to prove he's an American. I think Donald should only run if he could prove what's on that freaking head of his. Because mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. Is it alive? Is it dead? Is it orange cotton candy? Is it a ferret with the tail wrapped? I don't know. So, but I, but he's been good to me, and also he's done a lot of charity work with me for St. Jude's. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can't argue with St. Jude's Children's Hospital. It's one of the best. It's amazing. Yeah. It's an amazing one, and really, uh, that's an amazing comedy story that Danny Thomas, a comic, yeah, founded that place. Isn't that wild? Yeah. I'm really proud of myself because on The Apprentice, I realized I was a battle axe and crazy, but I earned 130 grand for my charity, The right. Gay Men's Health Crisis, and yeah. that's a charity and a half. They're fantastic. Hey, yo, Ron, after I took my mirror 50% cut, <laughs> I helped a lot of gays. You're welcome. All right, here's a, uh, another one for you, and this person actually drew oh. uh, a picture of a dog. I'm going to throw the glasses on this. Um, this is about Parker. Aww, is the love really of your like Parker still celibate? Oh, yeah. Because I don't like this whole sex thing. I won't allow sex in my house. By the way, I have like people sleeping over my house in Connecticut all the time, and I won't let them have sex. If I'm not having it, they're not having it. <laughs> and my dog Parker, we ended up, you know how you have to get them mm -hmm. the thing? What is that, spade, spade or neuter? neuter. Whichever yeah. one it is that a dog is, or a male dog, those are gone. And he was so funny, and you know, I made him gay because I, um, <laughs> I don't let him pee like a boy, because you know how boys have to like kick their leg up? Not right. him, he pees like a girl, and I dress him in outfits, and he's super cute. <laughs> <laughs> he's the best, he's super celibate, yes. Yeah, I don't know about you adopting. Uh... <laughs> oh yeah, well, you know, as far as I'm concerned, Parker stepped in S when I adopted him, because I, oh, I spoiled the hell out of him. So if I adopt a kid, my rule will just be you can't have sex ever. <laughs> and you have to take care of mommy when I'm pooping my diapers. I think, you know, I'm rich. Yeah. I can help that kid out a lot. That's all I'm saying, Ron. So, so what is it that bothers you about people having sex in your house, though? Is there something? OK. Yeah. Knowing that my nieces and nephews are here, I'm going to say it. Yeah. I am from Connecticut. <laughs> In Connecticut, we are very uncomfortable with the idea of sex. There is a sign when you enter Connecticut saying, welcome to Connecticut, you won't find your clitoris here. <laughs> I have always joked around, and this is very serious, I've always joked around in my past specials about sex, but I was never comfortable with it because I am actually very afraid of intimacy, meaning true intimacy. I blame my lack of a good relationship a lot on that. So I was never vulnerable in front of anybody. So I, I guess I'm just not really, I'm more, okay, I'm more of a Charlotte than a Samantha. <laughs> okay guys, could you explain that to the straight guys please? <laughs> So I just feel like it's something I have to learn about and grow with uh, the right person into, you know? So that is a goal, though. That is a goal. Uh, <laughs> you know what? Maybe it'll be too much work. I can only do so much. I'm trying to be peaceful and joyous. I have to have some douchebag treating me how to look him in the eyes. F you. I don't know. It's one of those things that's on my list. Maybe when I'm 70, I'll find the love of my life. Mm. But you know what? This is what I always say in my act. I'm working on my health, I got a nice career going, and even if I don't find the love of my life, it don't matter, because as my life coach and mentor, Meatloaf, once said, <laughs> two out of three ain't bad. Oh, that's true. <laughs> that's true. So true. This is another apprentice oh, yeah. question. Um, which one did you most respect? Which of the other? celebrity apprentices. Without a doubt, you probably noticed it on the show if you watched. There was only one girl I could stand on the whole thing. She was fantastic. I actually support her to this day, Clay Aiken. She was amazing. <laughs> 
And you want to know what's funny? I say that about Clay and my act and make yeah. fun of him a lot. And he came to see me once. He goes, wow, you took it easy on me. Because <laughs> he talks like that, like Blanche Devereaux from The Golden Girl. <laughs> And you know, I actually respected his work ethic and so much that I donated to his team so he could get some money to his charity during the show because I just love him. He should be elected to the Senate. He ran in North yeah. Carolina. How so. did, he didn't win though, right? Now he's gay and it's North Carolina. <laughs> uh, this says, do you feel that your act is more thoughtful because of social media? Uh, is that... Oh, has social media affected my act? Yeah. No. Well, once it was. <laughs> because everybody's taping now. So I really enjoy when something happens like that heckler situation. Yeah. But I'm very sensitive about the N-word. Because I got crucified on social media and in the real media and Wendy Williams, even though we've made up and everything, when I said the N-word on the Twitter about me and Lena Dunham, but I left the R off thinking that was okay because I'm a moron. So I put me in my nigga, oh, Lena Dunham. <laughs> well, you couldn't have seen two more white mayonnaise people than me and Lena Dunham, but everybody black was mad and even some white devils. So I didn't apologize for it, but I said, this is a word that clearly is a hot button for a lot of people. So I'm really a little conscious of that. Do you know who's in uh, kind of hot water for saying it on Mark Maron's show the other day? I don't know who. Barack Obama. What? Yeah. And he is one. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what's crazy. <laughs> like, we can't even call ourselves names, right. you know? I, it's a little too much. It really is. I mean, because I love the C word. The C word is my favorite word on the planet. And I, oh, thank you. And I call it to myself all the time. Is that bad? I don't care. So the only thing I worry about with social media is the N-word. So I just stay away from it. You know what I mean? It's only just because too I, it gives me too much heartburn. I can't. I can't. But every other line you're willing to cross, and you used to. You know, there's something about the word kike I do not like. And no, it, seriously, it sounds very hard. It found, sounds really, really racist. I have to make those decisions for my own. You know, I think sometimes the words have too much hate behind them. Uh, and and you'll, you ask any gay guy who comes to my shows, I say them all. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Hershey Highway Patrolman, Rectal Ranger, Turd Burglar, Dick Smoker, Log Jammer, Poo Pusher, Pillow Biter, Pickle Kisser, Sperm Burper, all of them. <laughs> John Travolta, <laughs> But there's something about the K word when it comes to Jewish people that I just, it won't come out of my mouth. And if I can't say it with a good conscience and look it in the mirror, look myself in the mirror, I say, ah, what am I doing? And that's something that's part of this growth that you're all a part I of. I guess so. It yeah. just doesn't, if it hurts me, it hurts them. Where do you see yourself in like five years? Do you have a goal? Oh my God, I have this be? awesome plan. Okay. <laughs> well, I decided that I, since I've revealed so much about myself during this special in a funny way, I really, I'm writing a play called Fat Girls Interrupted, and it's about, it's a vagina monologue style show, you know, the four women, but it's tackling different eating disorders and weight and body image issues and things like, and weight struggles. So hopefully that'll be out off Broadway next year. And I really would like to see that tour like the Vagina Monologues did to really help women or men too who struggle with any kind of self-hate about their physical being. And I think it'll really help people and resonate with them because I can't believe it hasn't been done yet. But with all my experience with that struggle, I think it'll really be something I could do well. And then I'd like to sort of do a I have this very well thought out. In three years, I want to do another special, but I want it to be about the journey from when my father died up until my spiritual growth, and I want to call it Spiritual Gangster, because I'm really like going hard and working really hard on myself. And then who knows, maybe a TED talk about service, maybe do like some uh, humorous, I, I, I know that's really funny to you, but <laughs> why the fuck is that funny? <laughs> See, that's like the reason people don't change, sure. by the way. That, is it you, stupid, and that stupid fucking beard, you dirty fucking heeb? Let me tell you about you. The reason you'll never change is because you laugh at people who want to change. That's not the way to do it, honey. The way to do it is to applaud people who want to grow and not be negative and put out that vibe. We would never be friends. We could never be friends, girl. See, see, that's negative. Yeah. You know, it's like, ah, ha, 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 ha. 
Really? Why don't I tell you I was date raped so you'd have a real big laugh for yourself, you <laughs> fucking moron? See how I can go hard, yeah. but I secretly love him in my heart. Sure. I don't. I hate him. I do hate him. I'll admit it, there's a little hate going out. Well, but, but see, that's the thing. When you are brave enough to tell people what you want to do in your life, there's people out there laughing at Caitlyn Jenner. It ain't right. Because he's brave enough, okay, he slash she, is brave <laughs> enough to say what they really are. So in five to 10 years when I have a TED talk or when I'm motivationally speaking in a humorous way, I'll think of this guy, but he'll spur me on to show people sure. everybody can change. It doesn't matter. They can still be funny and have a message too. Well, I'll tell you this, you can't be a spiritual warrior without being a warrior. That's and right. And you still got it. That's right. Everybody, Lisa Lampanelli, this is amazing. Amazing. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you so coming. much. Thank you, it was awesome. Unbelievable. Yay. Thank you.